good afternoon everybody good afternoon welcome back to another session of truth enlighten um i trust that um you had a good week and your weekend is after a good start and me i trust that god grant you good health and strength um This week, we're looking at the um, introduction to the book of Nehemiah. Last week, we did Ezra. All right? And um, at the end of this, I have a word, you know, the word, you know, um, which would be dealing with obedience. All right? So, without any further ado, let's get into it. Um... The time of trials. The time of trials required godly leadership. This book is principally the story of such gifted leadership in the person of Nehemiah. In the person of Nehemiah. Facing criticism and opposition, Nehemiah resolutely led the small Israelite community as they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem for its physical protection, but also did not hesitate to guide the Israelites spiritually by, by demanding that the Israelites obey God's law. Nehemiah pursued their spiritual as well as their physical welfare. Many readers naturally conclude that the book was written by Nehemiah because of the word of the first verse. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Echelah, it is widely believed that uh, Nehemiah organized the following passages. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Ch uh, chapter, chapter 12, verses 27 through 43. Chapter 13, verses 4 through 31. But there are two different views about two different views about the authorship of the rest of Nehemiah. Some believe that Nehemiah wrote the old book, relying on his own memories. Others believe that Nehemiah that Ezra wrote the book using Nehemiah's memoirs of the passages listed above as evidence for the second for the second view it is noted that uh, that Nehemiah 7 5 through 73 and Ezra 2 1 through 70 are almost identical The similarities of Nehemiah and Ezra can be explained partly by the fact that they are only one book in the Hebrew Bible. You can see the introduction to Ezra. In fact, many scholars argue that Chronicle argue that Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, were compiled by the same person. All these books exhibit similar similar themes, such as a focus on the Levite the Levites, the temple, and extensive lists. Which such priestly interested the one who masterminded this long document may well have been a priest. 
like Ezra. See the introduction to First Chronicles. The historical setting of Nehemiah is the, the setting of the second half of the Hebrew book of Ezra, Nehemiah, Nehemiah 4.58 to 4.20 B.C. During this period, the Persian, em the Persian emperor, Artaxerxes I, Longuminus allowed the Jews to return to their land and rebuild Jerusalem. At that time, Nehemiah occupied a prominent position in the emperor's court. He was the trusted cupbearer of Artaxerxes the Force. In Artaxerxes 20th year on the throne, 444 BC, he allowed Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem and rebuild its walls. Nehemiah stayed in Jerusalem for 12 years and then returned to Persia in Artaxerxes' 32nd year in 432 BC. Around 425 BC, Nehemiah left Persia and returned to Jerusalem for the last time. Third, chapter 13, verses 6. Nehemiah memoirs could not have been completed until after his second visit to Jerusalem. Thus, the earliest that the book of Nehemiah could have been completed would be around 425 BC. These, they are, there has been considerable discussion of the question of the order of the return of Ezra and Nehemiah to Jerusalem. The Bible clearly presents the return of Ezra as uh, preceding that of Nehemiah. Ezra returned in, in the seventh year of the reign of our text Ezra 7, chapter 7, verses 8. While Nehemiah returned in the twentieth year in chapter one, for chapter two, verses one. However, based on the way the revival of Ezra appears in the middle of the story of Nehemiah, chapter eight through chapter ten, many have argued that Nehemiah returned before Ezra. The argument for reversing Israel, Ezra and Nehemiah in this way are genuinely not convincing. Nevertheless, the inclusion, inclusion of part of Ezra's story in the middle of the Nehemiah memoir still needs explanation. It could be that Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of the city was also part of the reason construction needed among part of the reconstruction needed among God's people. Even more necessarily was the reinstitution of the law. Certainly, Ezra has been the uh, have used had used the law previously in his dealings with the people, but at this time, the great priest and scribe Ezra par pattern partnered with Nehemiah in order to truly teach the people God's law, in chapter 8, verses 9. Apparently, the compiler of Nehemiah, the compiler of Nehemiah wanted to show 
that the wall of the city would mean nothing without the wall of the law surrounding the people. His covenant with, with Israel, God had spoken of a place, of a place where he would establish his name. In fact, Moses had Moses had told the Israelites to seek the place where the Lord your God choose out of all out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place. Deuteronomy twelve five. Later it was revealed that this place was Jerusalem. When the temple was built during Solomon's reign, Jerusalem was at the height of its glory. Its fame helped to spread the glory of God's name throughout the nations. But God allowed Jerusalem to be destroyed because of Nehemiah's because of the faithlessness of the Israelites. Even though Jerusalem lay in ruins during Nehemiah's time, it was still God's purpose to establish his name there. The book of Nehemiah records the restoration of Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah. In the book, in the book, the returning Jews showed a spiritual, spiritual liturgy and a, and a cold-hearted indifference towards God. This problem continued for the book of Malachi denounce, denounces the Israelites for the same attitude. It took a determined, godly leader like Nehemiah to motivate this group to act on God's promise and rebuild Jerusalem's wall. However, the completion of Jerusalem wall is only half the story of Nehemiah. The walls are rebuilt by chapter 6 but the book has, has seven more chapters these last chapters record a revival and describe the the repo, repopulation of the city the subject of the book is is not merely the rebuilding of the walls but the complete restoration of the people of Jerusalem. The book of Nehemiah makes it clear that God did not restore his people only one time. Another, rather, he repeatedly, constantly, and continually restored his people. He sent a number of prophets and leaders to teach, motivate, and guide the people into righteousness, like he's doing today. Zerubbabel led a group of exiles to Jerusalem and began to rebuild the temple. See Ezra chapter 1 to chapter 6. Then Ezra led a second group of led a second group of exiles back to Jerusalem and helped restore the people to obedience to the Mosaic law. See Ezra chapter seven through chapter ten. Then Nehemiah returned and motivated the people. Uh, the people to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in chapter from chapter one to chapter six. 
Finally, Nehemiah returned a second time and exhorted the people to abhor closely, to adhere closely to God's law in chapter 13. The pattern is clear. God continually restored his people in spite of their unfaithfulness. God accomplished his will. The, the restored walls of Jerusalem, the repopulation of Jerusalem, and the repeated information of the Israelites was clearly God's work. In the end, his name would be glorified. All right? That brings us to the end of the introduction of Nehemiah. And in that introduction, right, the one thing is clear, that God is going to do all that he can to call his people back to him. He's going to use prophets. He's going to use priests. He's going to use ministers to bring his people back to him. And um, like he did with Jerusalem of old, and he's doing today. Right? So the onus is upon us to adhere to his call or reject it. Make your pick, make your choice. All right, today I would like to for us to look at... Um, obedience as it relates to children obeying their parents what the bible say about obedience in exodus chapter 20 verses 12 the bible says to honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the lord your god is giving you Right? It's a call for us to, as children, obey your parents. And when I said us, right, for those of us who are parents, you know, whether you're, you're young in age or old, as long as your parents is alive, it's the onus is upon you to obey. It's upon us to obey our parents in the Lord. The Bible tells us to obey our parents for many reasons. First and foremost, it is a commandment from God. In Exodus chapter 12, uh, chapter 20, verses 12, he said, We are told, honor your father and your mother so that your, you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. This is the first commandment with a promise. And it is one that should not be taken lightly. The benefits of our obedience are many. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, we are told that obedience will lead to a long and prosperous life. Additionally, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, it says, we are told that obedience is a sign of respect and honor. Obeying our parents will result in God's blessings. The consequences for our disobedience are also significant. In Exodus chapter 20, 12, we are told that disobedience will result in a shortened life. When we disobey our parents, we are disobeying God and breaking His commandments. The, the, the biblical principles of obedience differ significantly from American cultural standard of autonomy and individualism. In America, and I would say around the world, we value independence and self-reliance. We are taught to think for ourselves and to follow our own desires. However, the Bible teaches us to submit to authority and to follow the wisdom of those who have gone before us. 
How can we promote obedience of children in a Christian home? First and foremost, we must model obedience ourselves. If we want our children to obey us, we must be obedient to God. Additionally, we must be consistent in our expectation and in our discipline. We must also be patient and loving, always pointing our children back to the gospel. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6. I'm going to give you some a few verses that speaks to obedience. Children obey their parents. It says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, and your days may be long, and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So again, it is we are called to honor our fathers and mothers, right? That our days belong upon the land, and not only belong upon the land, but that things may go well, that it may go well with us, right? Proverbs 3, 1 to 2. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will have to you. The reason why many people are not enjoying peace, just disobedient, disobedient to God, disobedient to parents. Right? Um, if your parents is instructing you in the right way, then it's upon you to take those instructions. You reject the instructions, and that is why you see a lot of confusion and chaos in the world today, you know, because disobedience. And many youths and many young people are dying young because the Bible says clearly, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land in which the Lord thy God gave it you. Right? And not only that, that it may go well with you. Uh, so if you dishonor authorities, you dishonor the seniors, you dishonor, um, you know, the people who have gone before you, then, and disrespect, you know, disrespect them, then it, it simply means that you'll be cut off from the land, you know. My son, Keep your father's commandments and forsake not your mother's teaching. Proverbs 6.20 In Proverbs 13.1 it says, A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Proverbs 15.20 says, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Matthew chapter 15 verses 4 says, For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whatever reviles father, and whoever reviles father or mother, must surely die. It is clear. If you think that was the Old Testament, here we are in the New. The first book of the New Testament, Testament chapter 15, verse 5 says, For God commanded, it's a command, that you honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles or rejects their father or mother must surely die. It's, it's a penalty subject to death. Right? In Mark 7, 9 through 13, it says, And he said unto them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your traditions. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, 
who whatever you would have gained from me is carbon, what is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. Right? And um, it's, it's, a, as I, it's a very disheartening thing to look and see how people treat their parents, you know. Um, it's like they, they paved the way for you, they, they raised you, they educate you, they, they, they showed you the, 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 the right way, they provide for you, spend thousands of dollars, right, taking care of you, pay for your education and everything. And when they get hold, you push them in a nursing home, you know, push them in a corner. You know, I, I look at that and something is wrong with that. And if nobody don't see anything wrong with that, something wrong with you. Um, another thing, people spend years, right? They get the house, right? Parents, they get the house, they require it. They acquire the house. They raise you in the house so that you can be comfortable right? They happen to work hard, pay off their mortgages, and when they gotten hold, you, you know, take the property from them by all sorts of means and trickery sometimes, and then throw them in a nursing home. Something is wrong with that picture, you know? Um, <laughs> that's not right. You know, it's, uh, that's not right. And as we see, the same thing occurring, reoccurring. You know, people are suffering. People are going through the same thing. That happens. You do that to your parents. Your children do that to you. Their children do that to them. And it continues down the line. Honor your parents. That you, the Lord may bless you. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Mind you, in the Lord... For this is right, honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. And that it, what is the promise? The promise is that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. Right? The reason why many is not living long in this land is because of disobedience. Right? Dying young. Right? Gunshots and, you know, all kind of ways, but just dying young. Um, because of disobedience, the Lord says it. It's a command. It's a promise that if you live, if you honor your father and your mother, your days will be long and things may go well with you. Right? Don't be like Absalom, David's son. Colossians chapter 320. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now remember, yeah, we also know that there are some pe parents who does not honor God, some parents who, you know, don't give the right advice, and is there, you know, they're just there, you know. Some are just sperm donors, and some is egg bearers and all kind of thing. They really being parents. Now, you can't listen to them, for it says in Ephesians chapter 6, Verses 1 through 3, children obey your parents in the Lord. So if they're showing you the way of the Lord, they're training you up in the way that you should go, so that when you're old enough, you may not depart, that you obey, that you listen, and there you follow in, that footstep you follow in. Because there is consequences in disobedience. In Exodus 21, 17, it says, Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. We read that in Matthew if you think it was Old Testament, right? We just read it in Matthew, right? Say you shall surely die. Whosoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Right? Leviticus 29 says, For anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood is upon his, is upon him. Right? You curse your father or your mother, your blood is upon you. 
you will die. Surely. The Bible says surely. God don't go back on his word. If a man, according to Deuteronomy 21, 18, 20, 18 to 21 says, and this is how it would have been then, and um, so we know how it is now. It says, if a man has a stubborn, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and uh, though they dis discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take him, take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of this city, this, our son, is stubborn. And this goes to Tartar's son, any child. Stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Right? Um, we might not be stoning, you might not be stoned today, but the Bible says you shall surely die. Let me say this. Um, there's a lot of things that is happening with children today and you don't know why it is, you know, happening to people. It's because of disobedience to your parents. And if you continue like that, if you continue like that, you shall die a spiritual death, worse death. Right? You shall die a spiritual You shall be sealed in your ways. And probation would have closed upon you and then you die the everlasting death. No, you know, that nobody really wants, even if they don't know whether they want it or not. Proverbs twenty twenty. If one curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in utter darkness. Think about it. If one curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in outer darkness. Proverbs thirty seventeen. The eyes that mock the father and scorn to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. <laughs> now that might not happen literally, but they have situations, you know, where children uh, you know find themselves in very bad situations right and it's just as if the vultures pluck out your eye and if the i look at it from a spiritual standpoint they pluck out your eyes your spiritual eyes you can't see anymore so you can't even see that you're going wrong right and then the vultures the vultures you know i'm this is not biblical i'm you know, I'm saying what I think it to be. Now, the vultures are those who are waiting upon you to fall, right? You disobey your parents, you curse them, you think that you're doing the right thing, you want to look good before your friends, then your eyes is plucked out. Spiritually, you can't see. Then the vultures are those out there who are waiting to see you fall, right? It's going to turn wrong. And have a have a field day with you, you know, field day with you. Well, okay, let's go do this. Let's go. Don't listen to your mother. Don't listen to your father, right? And then they you follow their directions, and then you go along the wrong path. Next thing you know, you wind up in jail, wind up shot, wheelchair bound, you know, suffering, you know, in all kinds of different ways. That's what come to me as it would relate to the vultures plucking out your eyes and eating. Disobeying parents is a sign of, deba of a debased mind. Romans 1, 28 through 31. Here it says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a, rep to, to a debased mind 
to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are goss gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, artless, ruthless. You see, like I just said, right, I didn't reach this verse yet. Uh, when I was trying to explain what happens when you disobey parents and disrespect your parents, you'll be given up to a certain mind, a reprobate mind. And then, this is what happens. You become all of this. All this covetous, malice, envy, murder. Become a strife maker. You're deceitful, malicious. Serve for maliciousness, gossiper. You become a slanderer, a, a, a hater of God. You hate your parents, you hate God. They are insolent, arty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to your parents, foolish, faithful, artless, ruthless, ruthless. You look at the generation today, it's a ruthless generation. Everybody just thinking about himself. All right? It's just selfish, you know, everybody just for themselves, right? Get rid of mother and father, even if it means in order to progress, they take out their father and their mother self. I was watching the news day before yesterday where this girl kill her father and her mother and then take a saw and cut them up into pieces and bag them up and you know, just for her because she wants their money. Now, what happens when you're disobedient to God and your parents? Then you'll be given up to that mind and it becomes easy. Take your parents out. Not only take them out, cut them up with a chainsaw and bag them up. Right? What's wrong with that picture? Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, Right? This is the girl I'm talking about there. Arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid. Here what the Bible says now. Avoid such people. Right? Avoid such people. Sometimes you see, you know, if, you know, people try to avoid people, that's what they're trying to do. They're just trying to live in a car to the word of God. Because what are you going to do with such people hanging around these people? Right? They're ruthless. They're ruthless. They're reckless, right? They're conceited, you know, and they, 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 they just love pleasure more than they love God. So what are they going to do with you? Take it for instance, like I always said, some, um, you know, when I first started this, you know, we were talking and uh, somebody said, you know, talk about the, um, the followers or the likes, you know, the amount of likes or what it's you're not getting. I'm not concerned about that. I don't care for that. It's not, you know, nobody don't have to come on this, bro. I'm, I'm speaking the truth from my heart. I don't care, right? Because I understand the scriptures. I understand at least, not everything, but I understand this. In the last days, I know what the last days mean. And I also what, know what these things mean. If a person is a lover of themselves and they don't love God and they love pleasure more than God, then, and if I'm speaking about God, what they want to do? What they didn't want to hear this. This is not for their ears where they're concerned. So I don't care who thing because I, I, I know what it says. You know, I know what the Bible says about it. People run after pleasure. People run after lewd things, 
evil things, lawless things. Look at the things that get the following and get the likes, right? The things that is evil. Women showing out their nakedness, you know, people cussing and carrying on. That's what people like. People follow that. Look at TikTok. Look at all the people watching all these, getting all these views. Look at the things that is being shown, right? The people using them left, right, and center, right? So that they can be denied into the kingdom, right? Is the devil. So I understand my father's will for me, and I'm going to do his will. I don't care if nobody come on the program or what, but I thank those who take time out to listen to the word. To God be with you and God bless you, right? But it's not what I'm here for. I'm not here for popularity. I'm not here for likes. I'm not here for none of that. Keep your likes, keep your loves, and all of that. If, you know, I got to follow you along the path of um, destruction. No. Right? So, the Bible is saying this. Submission to authority and discipline, uh, and submission to authorities and disciples are good. Hebrews 12, 7, 11 said, seven, Hebrews 12, 7 to 11 says, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all of this participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. If your father does not correct you, is not your father, right? If the father loves his child, he's going to correct him. God loves us, so he's going to correct us, right? He's going to correct us. So if God is chastening us, that means he loves us. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. it. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who discipline us and we respect them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they discipline, the, for they discipline us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later, it, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Like you would hear some people say, I thank God that my parents did not spare the rod and spile me, for today it worked, is what makes me a better person. So, Discipline is for your benefit. So when God is disciplining us, it's for our benefit. It's for our benefit. All right, First Peter five five said, likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Is talking here about respecting the elders. And let's start with your parents. The first elder you're going to see is your parent. You respect your parents and you be, you know, you humble yourself to them. That is where it starts. And to all the other elders, whether your parents, whether a stranger, whether it's an uncle, whether it's a aunt, whether it's the person in the street, they're older than you. And they're showing you respect, show them respect. Right? Even Jesus did this. Jesus obeyed his parents. In Luke 2, 49, 2, 51 says, And he, Jesus said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you, know, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. Underline the word. He was submissive to them. And I repeat, right? 
He went down to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. In her heart, she loved it. She cherished it. She treasured it. The way the boy conducted himself, right? He said, I'm about my father. Now this is God. He's saying in the flesh, he said, don't you know I'm about my father's business? But his father was there, Joseph. So they, they were now confused, right? But nonetheless, he went with them, right? And he submitted himself to their discipline. Hallelujah. All right? So, that brings us to the end of this today's um, lesson on obedience. Children, obeying your parents in the Lord. And as you obey your parents in the Lord, there is wonderful things to come. God is going to bless us tremendously. You know, um, not only will we have the long days on this land, You'll have eternal days in the land of eternity. God is going to save you and, and restore life everlasting to you if you remain obedient. Obedience to your parents, obedience to God's will, obedience to the Word of God, right? If you listen to the Word of God and you don't like it, right? Don't be, you know, think about the preacher or the word. Just leave it and go about your business. Pass it, right? But be obedient to the will of God. And be obedient to your parents. And by so doing, things, you won't only have long life on this earth, but things will go well so that everything may go well. You put your hands to plant, the plant is going to grow. You're building it's going to come out right, right? Whatever you do, God is going to bless you because you're, do, you're, you're, you're do walking in His way, in His ways of righteousness, in the way that He ordained that you walk. And you're pleasing Him, He's going to bless you, right? Things are going to go well with you. If you don't do the all kind of disaster might come your way and you don't even know why it's coming upon you, and you continue going along because now you become blind, right? The vultures of this world pluck out your eyes. Now you can't see. And you're going down a very destructive path, right? I pray that you regain your sight and that you're able to see. See, first of all, that the Lord loves you and see that you love Him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so that you can love your parents, love your neighbors, love the unlovable, love those that don't love you, love those who hate you, and we're going to keep on loving so that we can fulfill, right? We can obtain the blessings of God. All right? So that's my desire, that you be obedient, and that's the will of God. I Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you for listening. And may God bless you and keep you. And may he cause his face to shine upon you. I'm going to close with a word of prayer. All right. Almighty God and Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for dying on the cross of Calvary for the remission of our sins. Thank you, Lord, for parents, Lord, for without them, we would not have been. We thank you, Lord, for the parents that is doing the right thing, that is bringing up their children in the way that they should go so that when they're old enough, they may not depart. I pray that those children may see that that is what their parents is doing and return the love and respect and humility and the kindness and the gentleness to their parents, so in so doing, they will receive long life on this earth, and in the life to come, they may, things may go well with them, and so that they can prosper, and be in good health, even as their soul prospered. We have too much disobedience, disobedient to authority, disobedient to parents, disobedience to God, disobedience to your word, too much disobedience in this land. So, Lord, I pray that you heal our land, heal us all, and so that we can be restored to you. 
In Jesus' most wonderful and precious name, keep everyone until next week. Bring them back at 4 p.m. and 5, respectively, to listen to your word and so that we all can grow and in unity and have one mind and understand that you are coming very soon, soon and very soon, so that we can be ready so that you can receive us unto yourself. Thank you, and may God bless and keep us all. In Jesus' most wonderful and precious name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you very much, and thank you for sharing. You can, you guys can, you see the, um, the link for, phase, for um, YouTube. Thank you, Brother Sean, for posting that. And um, for those of you who've missed the videos before, you go there and all the videos you'll see in YouTube. Share, like, love, you know, not for my sake, but because in it you see a blessing. Blessing for yourself and others. Thank you very much and God bless you. Until next time. Love you.